Uh, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for the uh, invitation and introduction. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I started my graduate school in, in the physics department, so I became a trader. I left, a graduate, uh, left physics before I finished my PhD, but my PhD was actually in medical physics, even though I focused on MRI. So uh, for this audience, I was thinking about uh, what to talk about because uh, we're working on a number of things in MRI, so I thought I would give you a little bit of broad overview and uh, highlight some of our work. So uh, much of the stuff that I'll be, pre be presenting are not necessarily from my lab, but uh, maybe half of that, it, half of the stuff is from my lab. So I want to talk about, about MRI as the field with a lot of advances and also uh, many biomedical applications. So here's a, a, a brief uh, outline. So I want to talk about basic principles, even though uh, for this crowd, uh, this stuff would be quite simple. Then some of the past advances that have uh, brought MRI uh, to, the, to its status today, some current developments, and also uh, a peek into the future. Just a, a, a brief uh, history. If you left after this slide, you wouldn't uh, miss much. So uh, MRI was, of course, based on this uh, physical, uh, physics uh, phenomenon known as NMR, uh, which was discovered in 1946 independently by Bloch and de Purcell, one coming from the classical side, one coming from the quantum mechanical side. And they were both awarded the Nobel Prize in 1952. Uh, so this has been, of course, used by uh, chemists and uh, physicists as, an, uh, as an analytical tool for many, many years before Paul Lauterbur uh, came up with the idea to make images with NMR signal. So Paul actually uh, invented this in, the, uh, in 1972, although his paper was published in 1973. Uh, then uh, the doctors took over. Uh, so the, uh, they took over in the early 90s. So it became widespread, uh, uh, widespreadly used uh, in clinical applications in the 1980s. They also did something that uh, we physicists probably don't like. They removed the uh, letter N. They don't like the word nuclear. So now it's called MRI. So it should really be called NMRI, right? Uh, then there, after that, it didn't stop the development, so there was a lot of significant advances, particularly a lot of hardware advances in the 1990s uh, that uh, allow us to make images in many different ways that I will show you today. So uh, then, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, another history associated with this is that, uh, oh, this is running out of juice, I guess. Uh, so there was another Nobel Prize awarded to this field. There are many others in between. Uh, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded to Paul Lauterbur and the Peter Mansfield in 2003 for the invention of MRI. So uh, just going through some basic uh, principles, as I said, this is uh, uh, based on NMR. But to form an image, we have to be able to discriminate signals from different locations. Otherwise, you just to get a summation of all the signals from the human body, from the head, or from the knee, or from the back, right? Now, uh, this is a, a physics uh, 101 or maybe 202. So when you have a nuclear, uh, a nuclear nucleus in the magnetic field, because it has a uh, angular momentum, it also has mostly has, likely has a magnetic moment. So it's going to precess around the applied magnetic field. So this is precession. And uh, we, of course, uh, cannot see individual nucleus very easily. So what we're going to see is uh, a bulk magnetization. Uh, because of the different energy levels, uh, there's going to be a slight tendency for these spins to be pointed along the magnetic field more than, the, uh, than against the magnetic field. So that gives us, th this difference gives us the bulk magnetization arising from the nuclei. Now I want to emphasize that uh, NMR is intrinsically a low sensitive uh, low sensitivity technique because this difference, population difference uh, under the field, magnetic field that we use for MRI is usually on the order of, of a few in a million. 
So a few parts per million. So out of a, a million, a million uh, uh, nuclei, we can only see a few of those. So it's not very sensitive. Unlike when you do nuclear experiment, when you have a radioactive decay, each event can be counted. So to do NMR experiment, of course, you have to, because this, uh, uh, these spins are precessed very quickly, so you have to perturb it at uh, this precession frequency, at the LAMO frequency. The LAMO frequency for the magnetic field that we normally use is usually on the order of about 6,200 60 megahertz, and that's what you would have on your uh, radio dial. So that's why it's the radio frequency uh, signal. So implicit in this, I already showed you that to have an NOR, you have to have a big magnetic field to polarize the nuclei, but then you also have to have an alternating magnetic field that's alternating at the radio frequency. So this gives you the NMR signal that you can detect uh, because this, uh, when, you, when you tip that magnetization from the Z axis to the XY plane, it's still precessing, uh, so it's like a rotating magnet, and then you can pick up that signal like what you do in a generator. So this is the basic principle of NMR. It gives us this signal that uh, uh, oscillates at the LAMO frequency uh, and also decays uh, due to relaxation time. So for spectroscopy, they will just take a Fourier transform of this and look at this spectrum and identify uh, the chemicals based on the location of this peak and also decide how much of that chemical there is by integrating this peak. So this is, what, this is what Paul Lauterberg was doing, except that he was, not a, a, he was a chemist, but he was not a conventional chemist. He had an had a NMR spectrometer that was not perfect, okay? If you are a perfect chemist, you want to make that spectrometer to be perfect, basically make the magnetic field uniform. He had a very non-uniform magnetic, uh, non-uniform magnetic field in his spectrometer, he decided to take advantage of it instead of trying to make it more uniform. So he, he, he figured that when, when, you, when you have spatial variation in that field, you can actually form an image by uh, these approaches, uh, by basically, you know, you can excite the nucleus selectively, not, in, not the entire sample. Then you can also spatially encoding uh, these signals. So I'm going to go through these a little bit. So the idea is then to introduce a spatial variation. The best, uh, the easiest, the simplest spatial variation is a linear variation in that magnetic field. And this is known as a gradient, okay? So when you have a linear variation in the magnetic field, you also have a linear variation in the LAMO frequency. So now we have a way of varying the LAMO frequency spatially, and you can do this in any, of the, any one of these three dimensions in space. So the first thing you could do is to do this uh, selective excitation. So basically, if your RF power has a, a limited bandwidth in power in frequency, so this is frequency, then that could be correspond to some location because you have also linear variation of the LAMO frequency. So that reduces a three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional problem. Okay. So now we are looking at a slice instead of the entire uh, head, okay? Uh, then you can also, because the signal that we get also, uh, also oscillates at the LAMO frequency, you can also introduce a variation now along one of the uh, directions of this two-dimensional two slice to make the frequency of the acquired signal to be dependent on location. So this is the frequency encoding, okay? So you get this uh, signal. Of course, the signal is going to be integration. Uh, of the to th that signal you get is going to be integration of signals at diff from these different locations. Of course, that's simply uh, the, uh, the Fourier transform. Okay? And uh, you can apply an inverse Fourier transform to this signal uh, to, uh, uh, to, get, uh, to get the signals at these locations, different locations along this direction. But it does not distinguish locations, the vertical locations, so it's a, it's a projection, okay? So you can use frequency, frequency encoding to get projections of, of, of this object. And this is what Lauterberg did. At the time, he did not invent the phase encoding yet, so he could only do projections 
of these two test tubes, okay, uh, at different angles. In fact, he could not rotate the, because he had a magnet, it's very hard to rotate the magnet, so he actually rotated these test tubes on a turntable. So basically now he had the projections at different angles, then use uh, uh, mathematics related to back projection uh, to read on transform, he can construct images. Okay. So he reconstructed images of these test tubes and published this in Nature in 1973. That was only like a half-page paper that got him the Nobel Prize. So, uh, so you can, I want you to remember this image because we're going to see how this image compares with the image that we're getting today. Okay. So this was uh, uh, all good because we were able to make images, and this is exactly, by the way, the mathematics is exactly the same way that, uh, same mathematics that's used to make CT images, computer assisted tomography images, based on X-ray. But people were not too happy because the math is complicated and also uh, the projections could be distorted when you have magnetic field in homogeneity and other, other variations of the field. So uh, people who worked on two-dimensional NMR, uh, they knew how to make two-dimensional spectrum. So the way to do that is to really introduce a phase to the signal, except, except in two-dimensional NMR, that phase is introduced based on the difference in resonance frequency. Here we can deliberately introduce the phase by, again, turning on the gradient. Instead of in the x direction, now we turn this gradient on the y direction. Okay, so you can turn it on for a finite amount of time. Uh, the spins will be uh, processing at uh, frequencies that depend on y. So you turn it on, then you turn it off. Basically, you make your sort of make your clock go faster, uh, go different speed depending on location in y. Then you make them the same speed again when you turn it off. So now you're setting the phase of that signal. So this is the, the basis of phase encoding. Basically, now you have the, the spins at different locations now uh, starting at different phase before you acquire the signal. So what's the key is that where this is the, uh, the time you acquire the signal, you still apply your uh, frequency encoding. Uh, but uh, these signals now also have a phase that is dependent on y direction. So the whole process of uh, the uh, MRI imaging today is very uh, uh, simply illustrating this picture. So you have spins along the X direction uh, going at different speed, like you have clocks that may be uh, going at different speeds. Then in this direction, you have uh, the clocks starting at different locations, like the time uh, difference between New York City and uh, uh, Los Angeles. So you could be uh, you could be at having a different speed in your clock, or you could be starting at different locations. So now this really corresponds to a two-dimensional Fourier transform. So now we have a two-dimensional distribution of, of magnetization signal. Uh, then we also have a two-dimensional Fourier transform. The signal that we're getting now is a two-dimensional uh, signal. One is with respect to time. That's when we turn that ADC on. The other one is with respect to uh, how much phase encoding you, you apply, basically the duration of that gradient being turned on. Okay. So the uh, signal, the raw signal that we're getting, uh, is this uh, uh, this uh, picture. Uh, this uh, picture that you cannot read, it, especially if you're a radiologist, you wouldn't be able to do two-dimensional Fourier transform in your head. So you have to do an inverse Fourier transform to convert that into an image. So this is the basic imaging. Of image frame, uh, formation principle. Now, to make this useful for doctors, you have to have contrast. Okay, if you just get a blank image, it's useless, even if you have a lot of signal, right? So the contrast uh, from uh, for most of the MRI images are based on relaxation times. Okay, so we know that uh, there are two relaxation processes. One is uh, once you knock down the magnetization to transverse plane, how fast it goes back to its equilibrium value along the z-axis, along the main magnetic field. That's the T1 relaxation, okay? So this determines how much magnetization you have left for your next excitation. So if you keep doing this repeatedly, it depends on how much signal you would start with after the excitation, okay? 
But the magnetization, when it's in the transverse plane, also decays exponentially, and that's the T2 relaxation. Okay. So if you acquire the signal not immediately after the excitation, say if you acquired it right here, then you have a signal decay. And that decay is going to depend on the relaxation time. So it turns out both of these uh, parameters, physical parameters, are affected by physiology and pathology. That is why it's so useful uh, for medicine. It turns out also uh, the guy who discovered this, initially discovered this kind of dependence, was, uh, was named uh, uh, Raymond Demadian. He discovered this about the same time, or maybe uh, just around the same time, Lauderber came up with the imaging uh, method. Okay? Uh, so uh, he, actually, he actually claimed that he should be also awarded the Nobel Prize, but he wasn't. So if some of, you, some of you were reading New York Times in 2003, you would have seen his one-page New York Times article co complaining how unfair it was. But he was not really the one who invented how to make an image. He only, invented, he only discovered that these, uh, phys these uh, parameters depend on physiology and pathology. Yes, it is. It is. Um, is. Is there any, any, any uh, is, is, the, is the story reliable? Is it true? Well, yeah, he, I mean, he discovered this. He discovered this dependence. He, but he did not, he tried to make an image, but he could not. So he actually had a very, uh, uh, I would say, very dumb way of making an image. Basically, he has this sort of point sensitive. Uh, in the scanning method, make the magnet. If you're only uniform in one point, then, then move the subject around that point. He had that method. But he did not come up with a spatial encoding approach. Yeah. So, in fact, the Nobel Prize Committee was hoping that uh, he would not outlive Lauderbur, so they were waiting. <laughs> they were waiting, then they waited, then, then Paul Lauderbur had a stroke. Uh, you know, a, a few years before 2003, they decided to give it to Paul Oliver anyway, even though they knew there was going to be controversy. Anyway, so this uh, slide shows you how you would get contrast. So you, so take for example, you have uh, 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 you have uh, you have gray matter, which uh, relaxes uh, back to the equilibrium slower, and the white matter, which relaxes back a little bit faster. Uh, so if you take, uh, so this is the repetition of how fast you excite. So if, you, if your time is not infinity, then you can see that there's a difference. So in fact, this would give you a higher signal in the white matter than gray matter. But now if you do a T2 dependence, so this is in seconds, this is milliseconds. Uh, so basically you acquire the signal, say, uh, 60 milliseconds after the excitation because uh, uh, white matter signal decays faster than gray matter. Now, the white matter is going to be darker uh, than gray matter. And this is what you would see uh, in this image here. Right? So uh, you have, uh, uh, this is a T1-weighted image. Uh, so uh, white matter is brighter than gray matter. And uh, this is a T2-weighted image. Uh, white matter is darker than gray matter. Okay. And of course, you can develop contrast agents also that change the relaxation time. For example, this uh, is a gadolinium-based contrast agent that goes preferentially to the tumor, particularly to the rim of the tumor. You can see that, uh, that the rim of the tumor is highly enhanced. It may actually uh, indicate a more actively growing tumor. Okay. So this is now the basic uh, sort of principles of MRI we talked about. Uh, Signal generation, image formation, and also image contrast. Can I ask you a now, yeah, of course. What, what are we looking at? I mean, you say gray matter and white matter. I think there's, there's some. Oh, so we are looking at the NMR signal, basically. Of what? Of, uh, of uh, mostly water. I'm sorry, protons. I forgot to mention that. Yeah. Yeah, so although there are other studies where we look at other nuclei, here we are only looking at the proton. And we know that the body is about 80% water, so there's a lot of signal. And also, it's the uh, protons is the predominant isotope. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, there is, a, so there are three things which I didn't talk about all three. I talked about the relaxation times. There's another thing is the density, the proton density. That's also another contrast uh, mechanism, but it's not very, uh, it's not very dramatic. So the relaxation times is uh, very different. And the relaxation times in this T1 weighted sequence, basically, you want, uh, you want to basically excite at the time intervals of, on the order of, uh, uh, of a second or so. So basically, we repeat that excitation every second or so. Then you get that T1 contrast. That's, that's, so that's why white matter goes back faster than gray matter. You have higher signal there. Now, you can also wait some time after the excitation to get your signal. And that's the T2 uh, relaxation curve. So the white matter signal decays faster than gray matter. Uh, yeah, so then it, the gray matter is brighter. That's why you see gray matter brighter here and uh, uh, white matter brighter here. This is a T1, this T2. Yeah. Yeah, it's the environment. It, it, it's more of the environment because the relaxation times are affected a lot by the environment. Yeah, even though we are all looking at water signal. Yes. <laughs> yes, gal gallium is a paramagnetic uh, uh, agent. Uh, reduce, it, it reduces the T1. So this is a usually this is a T1 weighted image, yeah. Uh, but gadolinium itself is actually toxic, so you have to chelate it. So most of the gadolinium that we use are chelated gadolinium. Uh, the we normally use a very small concentration, and uh, uh, the 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 parameter that's of importance here is the relaxivity, basically how much. Uh, uh, relaxivity changes with uh, a uh, unit uh, with a unit uh, concentration of the gadolinium. So, like, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, like a few inverse seconds per millimolar or something like that. Oh, uh, because the vasculature. The, this vasculature, the tumors are leaky, especially when they are growing. They, they, they all form new vessels, and the vessels, the, the new vessels are leaky. OK. So just as a recap, I want to talk about, uh, just to recap, that with MRI, the hardware that are most important are three pieces of hardware. You have the magnets. Uh, you have the, uh, the, the RF probes and detectors. The, the probe is used to sometimes both for the excitation and detection. So then, and also the gradients. Gradients provides the spatial encoding or the resolution. So these are the things that have uh, sort of in terms of hardware that have evolved a lot since, uh, since Paul Lauderberg's day of using just a non-uniform magnet as the gradient, obviously. So uh, as uh, as Bob mentioned, we now have this uh, MRI system uh, on campus. So this is, the, uh, this is a three Tesla system. So the magnetic field is three Tesla. And you cannot, you cannot see here, but in this uh, donut here is the magnet. And it, this magnet uh, is a superconducting magnet. And on top, you may see a little bit here, there's actually a pump that, you know, because it's cooled by helium, uh, so we use a recycling pump that you do not have to, uh, you do not have to fill uh, helium, which is very expensive, right? Uh, then inside, inside the bore here, uh, if we take the covers off, there will be the gradients, okay? The gradients uh, is, uh, is quite uh, extensive, and they have to cover the length, almost the length of this bore so that you can make, effectively make an image of this entire bore. Then over here is one example of the RF probe. Uh, Ward can tell you <laughs> his experience in it. Basically, so this is a probe that you can use for, uh, uh, for the excitation and uh, also the reception of the signal. Okay. Now, we are making it very snugly, as snugly as possible, uh, so that uh, it gives you the best uh, signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, in fact, you know, there's still a lot of development 
in this area because we always try to strive for the best si uh, sensitivity. Uh, as I said, NMR is a very insensitive technique. So uh, for those of you who are interested in this, of course, we're going to have a, an open uh, a dedication on January 30th uh, from 9.45 to 11.30. So you can come uh, see, the, uh, uh, see the instrument and also uh, uh, enjoy, enjoy the ribbon cutting and some refreshments. Yeah. Uh, right now, I think, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's only the best hospitals because this is the newest model. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, touch upon some of those factors. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, this would be uh, routinely available in hospitals very soon. I think this, this is the newest model. Uh, but the, other, the routinely available models are similar to this, uh, except uh, a few things that I, that I would mention in the next slide also. Yeah. So it is clinically available, but they are, they are using it in a different way that we would use because we are more focused on research and they are more focused on uh, routine clinical studies. All right. So I guess uh, most of you are still here, so I want to give you an opportunity to leave after this slide. <laughs> uh, so. I, you know, I've been in this field for 30 some years, so I sort of look at this field from a global view and see how, you know, these advanced MRI come about. So you can categorize it as three different categories, although these categories are mutually, uh, mutually interacting a lot. I'll, I'll give you some examples on that. So I already said that, you know, you can have uh, uh, advances in the hardware. So, for example, the, in the magnet of the early day magnets was based on permanent magnets. Now we have these superconducting magnets, okay? And we also go to a very high field. I will touch, uh, talk about that at the end if I had time. Uh, the gradients. The gradients were usually, you know, if you look at Paul Oliver days, his gradients are very, very weak because that was based on the uh, non-uniformity of his field. Now we have very strong magnetic field, uh, strong gradient uh, field. And also, uh, it's actively shielded. I will show you why we, we want to actively shield in a minute. Then with the RF technology, as I said, you know, there's still a lot of uh, uh, development today. So uh, now we have uh, multiple receivers. It used to be a single receiver, OK? Then when you go to high field, because these uh, receivers, uh, you know, uh, the uh, electromagnetic field behavior at low frequency and short high frequency behaves differently, particularly if you look at the wavelengths of the field. When it's comparable to the body size, it becomes, behaves very differently from when it's, uh, when it's uh, much uh, longer than the body size. So when we go to high field, that, field, that wavelength becomes very similar uh, to our body. And there's a lot of uh, complications there. Okay. So now we have much faster receivers, so allow us to digitize the signal at the LAMO frequency used to be that uh, in, with a standard NMR, it will take the NMR signal, then use a mixer to load it to an intermediate frequency, then you digitize it there. Uh, to, or then you load an audio frequency to digitize it, the load audio frequency. So there is a lot of problem with that. So now we can actually directly digitize it at the LIMO frequency. Because of that, we can digitize it right at the scanner. Okay? Uh, then also now we have uh, multiple transmitters not only multiple receivers, but multiple transmitters. So our scanner now has all of these, okay? And also the magnets now do not require any helium, okay? The old ones require helium. The even old ones required the, a outer cooling with nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, okay? So this is the development on the hardware side. So uh, really, the, main, the, the major development is this gradient. Okay, well, because of this self-shielded gradient, now we can run these gradients really, really fast. Now, I'm sure most of you have heard of eddy currents. So when, we, when I turn the gradient on and off, it's, there's a big change in magnetic field. And uh, we know that there's going to be a 
uh, change that re that's going to resist it. That change is generated by sometimes generate the eddy current, and usually in, in conductors. So our sh our casing of the of the uh, uh, of the doer, basically our doer is is the metal. So that generates a lot of eddy current, which sort of uh, resists any change in magnetic field. So even though I showed that nice uh, you know time wave of uh, gradient, but we could never get there. Okay, we could get they're better by shielding the magnetic, uh, shielding that field. Okay, because of that, we now can switch the gradient very fast. What's that going to do to us? That's going to allow us image very fast. So, it's uh, so so instead of taking minutes to get an image, now we can take uh, less than a second to get an image. So that allows a lot of things. So that allow us to make uh, images a diffusion. Because diffusion is a small movement, and if you don't image fast, you're going to get crappy images. Okay, that allow us to look at uh, uh, the heart, which moves all the time, so cardiac imaging. Okay, and that also uh, allows us to uh, look at uh, uh, the blood flow, a diffusion tensor, and all that. Okay, so these hardware of development were driven partly by these applications, but also. Uh, sort of fuel the development of these new applications, new methods and new applications, OK? So is this the basis of functional MRI? Yes, it is the basis of functional MRI, because you, you want to be able to get images on the order of seconds instead of minutes. We want to see how brain is in, in sort of in, uh, in action. Also, I want to point out that uh, uh, Peter Mansfield, the other guy who got the Nobel Prize with Lauderberg, did not invent MRI, but he actually developed uh, this idea of a self-shielded gradient. And also, he introduced uh, echo plan, uh, this uh, echo plan imaging, which can give you images less than uh, 100 milliseconds. Okay. So on the method side, okay. so this is the hardware side. On the method side, uh, there are many advances. Some of these are related to encoding. How do we encode faster, get images faster? So, uh, so echo planar imaging is one thing that I mentioned about. Uh, then you can do the parallel imaging with the introduction of the multiple receivers. Okay. Then you can also do now parallel transmission that allow you to transmit better. Okay. So these methods were made possible, even though some of the ideas uh, were already there before these hardware were there. And some of the ideas were, came about after these hardware were there. So there's an interaction between these developments. Okay. Then with these developments, we develop new applications. Okay. I already mentioned the cardiac, applic uh, cardiac imaging. Then neuro imaging, we can do look at brain function. We can look at fibers of the brain. I will elaborate on this uh, in a minute. Uh, so these new applications uh, partly drove these developments, but also were made possible by these developments. So these developments in these three areas should not be viewed as isolated, but they are really interacting with each other. Okay. Also, if you look at this now, it requires the work of people of many disciplines, of engineers, of physicists, uh, chemists, and uh, also biomedical scientists. So if you want to leave, I wouldn't be offended. <laughs> so just a, some quick uh, uh, highlights of the development. So in the magnets, as I said, we can go from permanent magnet to electro, electromagnets uh, from resistive magnet to superconducting. Then we now also have the high, uh, actively shielded magnets. So if you, the magnets are made basically of a solenoid. So if you, have, you want to make a uniform field, you have to have a long solenoid. But then the, uh, the straight field will extend out very long. Okay? So then you have to put some, uh, some field in the opposite direction at the end to counterbalance that. And this is what we have in our new scanner. In fact, we were initially worried about the field being uh, a field outside the scanner room being too high for people with pacemakers. But because they did the shielding, we were able to make it safe. Okay. Then, of course, helium is very expensive. You have to recycle it. Nowadays, there's also even cryogen-free magnet. Basically, you just use a pump to cool it. So that's now this is the thing that I was talking about for gradient actively shielded. So if you ignore this outer layer, uh, 
this is what the gradients will look like. Uh, this one uh, will generate one of the X, Y, y gradients. So when you turn this uh, inside shell on and off, it's going to generate a field outside. Okay, so generate off your side. The outside is your is your door, the magnetic uh, casing, basically. That's going to be the eddy currents. That's a major problem. So Peter Mansfield came up with the idea of doing actively shielding. Okay, so if you use a another sort of a current pattern in the opposite direction then the two fields outside will be canceling each other. Now inside, they are not going to cancel each other because it depends on distance from the location inside to, the, uh, to that gradient. So there is a, a different, uh, there's a difference in the distance, so there's a difference. Of course, you have to, to make the same gradient, you have to give it more power. Okay. So this is the actively shielded gradient, which is a must for many of the things we do today. And that another thing that we can do is the, uh, uh, is the multiple coils. So you can do, uh, say, eight channel coils around the brain, or 32 channel coils around the brain. One thing that it brings immediately is the signal-to-noise ratio increase. Uh, the other thing is, as I said, in the canal, because you have these multiple arrays, these arrays themselves become a way of providing spatial information, right? So from this array, most of the signal is going to be from the back of the head. This is going to be from this side of the head, and this is going to be from this side of the head. So you can now use that information to augment the spatial encoding that you achieve with the gradients. So it essentially gives you, uh, allows you to image faster. So now I can, we can get an image of the whole head uh, in, uh, 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 there should be, uh, 23, 23 seconds. This is to hold the head. We did not do this in water. We, we were not sure if you could tolerate this. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, we could do this. And uh, of course, you can get uh, brain functions with that. All right. This is just a different slice of the brain, basically going from left to the right of that person. Uh, yeah, this is a three-dimensional uh, image of the head, basically. No, yeah, over the whole body. I mean, it's the length, length uh, scale of the magnet and the gradient. Uh, yeah, typically it's about either 50 centimeter. Uh, that's the usually the effective uh, uh, field of view because that's how uniform, you have to have a uniform magnet and you also have the gradient linearly. And is this in water or not? This is still water. But it's um, different ways of getting the water signal. Okay. So, uh, so this is the image that we can get today, and of course I want to show you another image because this is an image that uh, uh, was obtained when I uh, started at, at, at Emory, uh, Georgia Tech. So you can compare now this image to the first image that Paul Lauderber produced. Okay, that, although that was the image that got the Nobel Prize, but you would like this image much better, I would think. So this is the kind of you know, images you can get today. Uh, with, so this is what doctors like. You can see the structure. Uh, you can see that uh, for like a, a spine. You have a problem with the spine. You can see it here. Uh, you can see the knee, uh, liver, uh, kidney. So MRI is used widely in clinical practice. But uh, the, for the rest of the time, I want to talk about beyond that structural imaging. I said you can do function, cardiovascular imaging. Uh, you can do brain function. And also, you can look at some biochemistry, and you can look at molecular information. Uh, a rule of thumb would be about a millimeter. Yeah. So this is an image uh, that you can get now. You can get the coronary artery uh, with MRI. Uh, so I'm going to now uh, do a little bit more detailed discussion on brain imaging. So this is, uh, you know, this is why we got this scanner here, and this is uh, uh, an area that I have spent about 20 years uh, working on. So uh, let's look at physiology first. Even though uh, we are physicists, I'm a physicist by mes uh, myself, so, uh, this, so I'm trying to simplify this. So when you have a, have a neural activity, we know that you know, you're going to do some work, so you have to do some increase in metabolism. Okay, 
uh, there's going to be uh, an increase uh, uh, in the metabolism, and some metabolites that may provide signals for some physiological activities. But what is important to us is that uh, it's actually going to uh, 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 increase uh, the utilization of oxygen. So it's going to change, convert uh, uh, oxygen in the hemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin. Okay, remember uh, that. But at the same time, uh, in order to provide more nutrients and more oxygen, so you actually increase the blood volume and also the blood flow. Okay. Now, interestingly, the amount of increase in the blood flow is much, uh, much higher than the amount of increase in the oxygen utilization. So in the returning blood, you're actually going to have a reduction of uh, deoxyhemoglobin. You know, remember, blood uh, brings uh, oxygen hemoglobin. When it's used, it becomes deoxygenated. They are both increased, but this increase is much bigger than this increase. So you have a reduction in deoxyhemoglobin. So that gives us one way of probing the brain function, uh, because uh, you know the, this uh, brain activity can change deoxyhemoglobin. Okay. Now there are other ways to do fu brain function. You can measure the blood volume, or you can measure the blood flow. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that. So the uh, the basis for measuring deoxyhemoglobin was based on this contrast known as the blood oxygen level dependent contrast. This is the contrast uh, that uh, Ken Kwan initially worked on. Uh, so the contrast was uh, based on the fact that uh, when the hemoglobin is carrying oxygen, it's just diamagnetic. So it's very similar to other tissue. In other, so as far as the magnetic field is concerned, it's the same as tissue. So it would not change the uh, in, it, it will not create a variation in the magnetic field. Uh, but when it's deoxygenated, it becomes paramagnetic. It's very different from the tissue, so there is going to be an inhomogeneity in the magnetic field, a local inhomogeneity in the magnetic field generated by blood. So that's why it's a blood oxygenation level dependent contrast. Uh, this was discovered by C.J. Ogawa. Uh, this, uh, this is not his original image. Uh, but uh, this is one image that we obtained at 7 Tesla. Uh, so you can see these, these dark regions are not actually uh, not uh, voids of uh, water, but voids of signal because uh, the uh, veins, veins contain a lot of deoxygen and hemoglobin. Okay? So uh, when CJ was doing uh, experiments, he was actually not looking at this. He was, uh, this is another serendipity, he was looking at rats, uh, uh, in the, uh, imaging rats, then he found that when the rats are dead, these dark things show up very prominently. Okay? So then he was a chemist. He remembered that this hemoglobin susceptibility difference, he said, gee, now we can see the blood, the oxyhemoglobin in these images because they become very dark. So he coined this term bold. Okay? And because the physiology is so helpful, as I showed you before, the diastic humbler will actually go down with brain activity. So then the MRI signal would go up. Indeed. So when you do, an, uh, say, this is a motor task where the subject is moving fingers, if you look at the signal in the motor cortex, it actually goes up when the subject is moving and it goes down when the subject stops moving, go up and down, right? Even though it's a small difference, you can see that's about 2% signal change. OK, just based on this 2% signal change, we can now map out the region of the brain responsible for this, uh, uh, this motor cortex, for the motor activity. And same thing, we can uh, do a, uh, this is a tension uh, uh, activity. And you can see that you can actually paint the activity now on top of the cortex. This is actually because the brain is convoluted, we can actually inflate it with computational techniques to make a, a brain flat, uh, I mean, uh, you know, to, 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 inf to inflate it. So then you can see that these activities on the sort of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the sulcus instead of the gyrite. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's a few seconds. <laughs> 
because it's a physiological response secondary. Yeah. You can do many things with it. You can also use it to read the mind. So, for example, you can tell if the person is happy or sad, or uh, using, uh, you know, using uh, uh, one language or another, or moving the left hand or right hand. Okay. So this, uh, you know, fMRI has become ubiquitously used in neuroscience uh, uh, science studies. Uh, but also now, to answer questions about where, and uh, but also we can use it to answer questions about how. Basically, we can uh, derive how the brain, different parts of the brain, is talking to each other, based on fMRI signal. We can look at the temporal information in the signal. Uh, so one thing that we are using. Uh, let me see how much time I get. Okay, I'm running out of time, so maybe I should quickly. So. Uh, is to use the Granger causality. Granger causality is something that was used uh, to analyze how one stock affects another. So we can use the same way to, uh, you know, to see how one region is affecting another by using Granger causality. Okay. Uh, so in this uh, experiment here, where the subject was trying to uh, tell you whether these patterns are different by uh, feeling them, so it's a sensory task, uh, but it also has. Uh, activities in the visual cortex. The neuroscientists uh, were interested in how these different regions are talking to each other. Just by looking at this pattern of activity, it's very hard to tell. But by looking at the Granger causality, we can see that these regions are talking to each other. These, I don't know if you can see the arrows. But also, the amount of talking for people who do very well with this task is different from the, uh, from the amount of talking of those people who don't do so well. Okay. And then if we look at exact connections, we were able to answer this question that neuroscientists really want to answer is whether this is a top-down control or bottom-up control. OK. So uh, the, the other thing that we can do, I guess this movie is never going to show. Never works. OK. Uh, so uh, you can also now look at the brain in action when we lie in there. So if the movie was shown, you can see these patterns tune in and out. And it would look, this is when the subject is not even doing anything. So this is the so-called resting state functional MRI study. Okay? It may, look, may appear random to you, but it turns out if we use some modeling, uh, some of you may know this uh, term, a hidden Markov model, to see how they, assuming that brain is going between these different states, then we were able to derive uh, nine different states that brain is switching between, even though the subject was not doing anything explicit. OK. So then we can utilize uh, these patterns to tell you whether the subject is normal or not. For example, when we look at Parkinson's disease patients, they have a lot of activity in one of these states that corresponds to motor. So uh, other things you can do with MRI, you can also measure blood flow. So with PET, it's very easy. So you inject, the, uh, I'm sorry, you inject the isotope into the blood, into the heart, then the, that isotope goes to the brain. You can measure that. But with MRI, we don't have to do the injection. We can use a spin tagging. Basically, we apply RF impulse to the blood to tag it. Then when it goes to the brain, we can see uh, how much of that tagged blood goes to the brain. That gives us a way of measuring blood, very non-invasively. Right? So this is the kind of blood, uh, cerebral blood flow measures you can get. So you can see that green matter has more blood flow than white matter. Uh, you can also use blood flow as the basis for measuring brain activity. I'm going to skip there. So I want to talk about this a little bit. So this is, uh, you know, uh, Water is, of course, not standing still in our body. It diffuses all the time. But if you also have organized tissue, that diffusion is going to be uh, uh, anisotropic. Okay? So it's going to diffuse more along the tissue than perpendicular to the tissue. And it turns out with NMR, you can measure diffusion. Basically, you can apply a gradient uh, in one of those directions. The signal is going to decay with gradient. Uh, this uh, decay is uh, proportional uh, to the diffusion coefficient. So you can, you can apply it in one direction, or you, you can in this direction, or you can apply in this direction. So there's going to be less decay because there's less diffusion in this direction, and there's going to be more decay that in this direction. So we can now apply this in a number of directions by applying in these gradients. 
And uh, so to get a symmetric tensor, uh, you only have six variables. So you can, ideally, you only have to apply this, to, this gradient in six different directions in space. Then you get these images, right? From these images, then you can ca calculate a diffusion tensor. So you can calculate a diffusion tensor. These are the six uh, parameters of that tensor, OK? So you can see that. This is the same slice, but uh, being, uh, Im being uh, imaged with diff gradients in different directions. You can see that, uh, you know, for example, uh, this, this fiber here is very bright because the, the gradient is perpendicular to it. But when you come here, it's very dark because the gradient is along it. Okay? So you can, from these diffusion images, you can get this tensor image. But this tensor image is not very useful because what that value is depends on the physical axis of these gradients. It does not depend on the natural axis in the brain, like the way how the fiber is oriented. Of course, uh, we can uh, do a uh, diagonalization, basically a matrix rotation to rotate to the natural coordinates of the fiber. Basically, you have this principle. Uh, these are the diffusion and not a principle axis, basically, of the fiber. So now this is meaningful. This no longer depends on how you put the patient in. Okay? So this now gives us the, uh, uh, the diffusion tensor, but also the, the rotation matrix tells us how this fiber is oriented. Okay? So you can get uh, a uh, anisotropy, basically the differences between those principal uh, uh, diffusion values. Uh, you can get an average diffusion. And you can also get the di direction of the fiber. You can see that uh, the anisotropy is mostly in the wide matter because the wide matter are the uh, wiring, uh, the regions with the, the wires in the brain. Okay? And then you can get these uh, directions. Based on this direction, you can perform tractography. Uh, basically, follow these fiber, uh, fibers. For example, this fiber going from the region of uh, uh, language production to the language comprehension. Okay, you can now apply this to uh, interesting studies. For example, in this study, we were looking at uh, patients who were prenatally exposed to alcohol. Basically, mothers were drinking during pregnancy. And you can see that uh, there's a reduction of the fiber connection between the two halves of the brain in these subjects. That actually explains a lot of the behavioral problems they have. And this is an interesting study that was uh, performed by Jim Rayling in collaboration uh, with us, uh, looking at uh, this uh, language fiber I showed you uh, in three different uh, primate species. We know that we have pretty good language capability. Uh, and the chimpanzee may be a little bit, and macaques very little. And you can see that they all have this connection. But when it comes down to the temporal area, we have a lot more than chimps, and chimps have more than, uh, than macaques. That gives us. Uh, uh, so tells us uh, something about evolution. Uh, this is another clinical application. I'm not going to. I'm going to skip here. So I'm just going to talk quickly about what's on the horizon. One thing is to be able to look at the molecular things, not just the functional structural. So molecular imaging, uh, as defined by Weisleiter, is the in vivo characterization and the measurement of biologic processes at the cellular and molecular level. So for us, of course, we're not going to look at individual cells, individual molecules, but looking at an ensemble of them. So the first thing we can do is to uh, measure, the, uh, measure the biochemicals in the brain. So we can do in vivo spectroscopy to measure uh, things like uh, N-acetyl aspartate, which corresponds to neurons, uh, choline, lactate, which uh, would indicate uh, lack of blood. So these are the things we can measure non-invasively. So in the tumor, you can see that there is a uh, increase in the lactic acid. So I'm just going to skip this here. And uh, this is uh, using uh, MRI to track cells. So you can uh, put iron oxide nanoparticles uh, in, uh, in the cells. So this is uh, uh, lymphocytes. Uh, then you inject them into the, uh, into the subjects, uh, into animals or human subjects, and you can see how these cells migrate because these uh, uh, these uh, nanoparticles will show up as dark. We could also trick the biology to make nanoparticles for us. Uh, 
So we can use a gene expression to make animals, uh, to make cells to make nanoparticles. This gene is from uh, this bacteria known as magnetotactic vector, which makes magnets themselves. We take the gene from this bacteria and put them uh, uh, this, this particular gene in the, uh, in the mammalian cells, uh, then voila, these cells, when they express the genes, you can see that these nanoparticles, these are, uh, uh, these nanoparticles, these cells, when injected to the animal, they show up as dark. Now we can distinguish the cells with or without gene. This is not with any externally loaded nanoparticle. Uh, one thing that I want to point out here is that we're going to more quantitative. So, for example, this is a study by Jason Lanley here, uh, who is in the audience. We looked at the substantial agora uh, with two types of contrast. One is a T2 contrast, which reflects ion deposition. The other one is a neuromelanin contrast, uh, which uh, uh, reflects neuromelanin. Now, in Parkinson's disease, both of these are, uh, are uh, affected. So. Uh, we can look at this uh, region also, use this region for the analysis for other measures. For example, for the diffusion tensor measure, we can see that with this analysis, we get a bigger difference. The significance is much better than without this analysis. And we can also see how much ion deposition is increased in Parkinson's disease compared to its controls. We are able to now uh, tell the difference between them with very high uh, confidence. So quickly, I want to say that you know, the MRI field is actually, uh, the evolution MRI is sort of evolution magnetic field strength. So this is what you uh, have for uh, NMR. This is the field strength used for human, but it only goes back to uh, 2002 or so. So now we are getting to uh, 11 Tesla for the humans. So there is a big increase in the field strength. There are obvious reasons from the physics point of view. Uh, the signal to noise ratio goes up uh, theoretically, linearly, okay? When you increase that uh, signal, you can increase spatial resolution. Also, the, for spectroscopy, the dispersion of those peaks uh, getting wider. But for uh, MRI, there's, there's also change in the contrasts. Uh, that's uh, coming from the relaxation times, okay? So just some quickly, uh, I don't know if you can see back there. So you can see that, you can see these vessels in these seven Tesla images, but you can't see them uh, in the uh, 1.5 Tesla. Uh, this is an image that's uh, landed to me from Jeff down from NIH showing you that these are uh, just looking at the phase of NMR signal. Remember, the NMR signal itself has a phase. And the, the, what corresponds to maybe some susceptibility difference in the brain. This is the natural susceptibility differences. And these are images showing very nice structures. If you give them to a radiologist, they wouldn't be able to interpret this because they don't know what they mean. But at least we know that these are very useful, very interesting structures there. OK, so I'm going to just stop, skip these slides. And so uh, summary, MRI has evolved into a mature and powerful technique in the clinical arena, but also a multimodal technique by itself for many applications. Yet advances are still being made after 40 years, you know, after 40 years of the first MRI image, right? For neuroscience application, MRI is the most powerful and versatile tool. So that's why we're getting this scanner here. Of course, we're interested in other applications. MRI in the future will have higher resolution, more versatile contrast, more quantitative capability. I will stop here and uh, acknowledge the uh, people who did most of the work. Uh, Jason is here in the audience. Uh, but there are many others who did this, and also collaborators and funding agencies. Thank you very much. I did. I skipped the slides there, so maybe I should go back. Uh, so I skipped a few slides here. So. Uh, so this slide here. So you know, people are modeling the brain <coughs> using these uh, sort of connections. So now we are actually getting these connections. This is a big data problem. I guess that's really so. You can get actually 60 terabytes of data, uh, you know, just based on this uh, these connections we have, and you can use it to model it and model how the brain functions. And the other thing is to for the big data is to actually correlate the imaging data with genetic uh, data so that you can 
a look at uh, you know, how different genes affect the imaging measures we get. Yes, Jean? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I think, uh, you know, uh, from a, uh, you know, I was talking to, uh, to one of uh, your colleagues earlier is that, you know, there's uh, this nano, obviously nano technology could be one way to, to, you know, to alter the contrast, make it interesting. The other thing is that there may be also implantable uh, probes and implantable devices that we could use. Uh, finally, we may be able to use some of the newer techniques, uh, uh, like uh, social with uh, maybe nit nitric uh, uh, vacancy and all that stuff, to make it into new applications. Um, so who knows? The sky's the limit. I think I you know. I always thought that I would be on a job in a few years, but uh, the more opportunities come out. Yeah. What? Right, so yeah, we actually, I did not show any slide here, we actually uh, you know, did some work in measuring the electrical activity uh, directly with, with MRI. We, we have had some success, but uh, obviously it needs more uh, work. That's one thing. The other thing I want to point out is that you know, there are two other measures, this, the blood flow and the blood volume. Those measures are actually more specific than the boat measure. So in terms of, uh, you know, directly related to the uh, brain activity. Uh, certainly, you know, there's interest in looking at more direct measures and also fast measures. So electrical activity is something that is really fast, obviously. Oh, no, we're not injecting spins. We are just to uh, use the RF to, uh, to alter the spins. Oh. So th there's no injection. Right. Yeah, but that's non-invasive, right? Non-invasive, completely like, non-invasive. Like, well, in the patient, basically, they wouldn't feel anything. <laughs> they, they would just lie down there. We would apply the RF pulse to the, to the blood to, uh, to uh, to invert the magnetization, basically. Like on the wrist, or? Uh, usually on the neck, or, yeah, in the neck area. And you rely on the long, you rely on the yeah, relaxation time, yes. Yes. Is there a relation of PET scan higher than MRI? No. PET scan is lower, uh, even though they are more sensitive, but they can only use so much isotope. We have a lot of water in the body, so. <laughs> We are blessed with that, even though we are not very sensitive. Uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, uh, seven tesla is okay. okay if you put the subject in very slowly. You, <laughs> what, what you don't want to do is the abrupt magnetic field change. You know, if you have a abrupt magnetic field change, it may induce. Uh, uh, eddy currents in your brain <laughs> and it uh, messes up your vestibular system so you feel dizzy. Well, PET scan probes different things because you can make a biomolecule with uh, radioactive material then it's very specific to that biomolecule. So here we are still looking at the water signal and how it's affected by other things. So his PET is very specific and very quantitative. So whatever radioactivity you measure is directly uh, corresponding to the amount of that biomolecule. So that's why PET is very, very specific. So PET is very good for looking at the function. It, it gives you a very fuzzy image because the spatial resolution is poor, but it, it's very specific to the things you want to look at. Yeah. 
Well, basically, they have these uh, uh, sort of different streams of uh, how information is being passed uh, around from, you know, from one part of the region of the brain, from either top of the brain or to the bottom of the brain, see how the control is controlled, whether it's a top-down control or bottom-up control. Well, it's, yeah, mostly physical locations of the different brain regions. Yeah. Not strictly, you know, but 